Mr. Mittal is a recipient of many national and international distinguished awards, including the Padma Bhushan, one of India's highest civilian awards. With these words, may I now request him to kindly make his welcome address. I'm delighted to welcome you here today at the India Economic Convention, an event which has been organized jointly by ICC and India Foundation. This particular event couldn't have come at a more appropriate time when the globe is going through paradigm shifts of an order that have not been witnessed in many decades. From the last 10 years of emerging markets showing a growth rate between 6 and 8 percent, suddenly we see a lot of turbulence that is developing amongst even the emerging markets. On the other hand, as Europe slows down, China has become a big issue on the world agenda. The strong engine of growth that was leading the entire globe, China has certainly slowed down. There's a decisive slowdown in China, which is leading to massive drop in commodity prices the globe over, the effects of which are being felt all across the world. The BRICS nation, which were cherished and celebrated for over a decade, are finding that other than I, which is India, all other pieces of BRICS are currently under one stress or the other. China, as I mentioned, is slowing down. On the other hand, Russia, with its sanctions, and South Africa, with its commodity prices going down, have had massive devaluation of their currencies. We are seeing Brazil being downgraded just a few days back. That takes away the other important element of BRICS. That leaves India as one shining part of BRICS and the growth story that is still intact in the emerging markets. India has held its currency fairly well. We have had a drop of only 3 or 4 percent in the last uh, few months. India's growth rates are still at 7.2 percent. We are expecting India's growth rates to be back at 7.5 to 8 percent in not too distant future. What is keeping India different from the rest of the world? When the entire globe is under stress of uh, growth, when sector after sectors are showing stress, how is India managing to still cruise along? I think uh, there are very clear and fundamental strong factors here. India is a large market, is an aspiring nation. Over 65 percent of people are less than 30 years of age. And we are talking about a continent of consumers, 1.2 billion people, 65 percent of which are young, who are aspiring, who are consuming. So that makes India a clear growth market. India is a government which is at work today. As Sandeep Somani mentioned in the executive board yesterday, he has never seen, and I would say all of us can confirm that, a more hard-working government than the present government. It has a clear vision for India. It is rallying the investors, both domestic and global, around certain missions that it is directing forward. Make in India, digital India, skilling India, and I think importantly, cleaning India, which is a Swachh Bharat. Around these four missions, you can build phenomenal businesses. India recognizes very clearly that while it will grow its infrastructure, it will add a lot of jobs in the service industry where it has the strength, it is the manufacturing industry which needs to be brought back onto the main stage. Because manufacturing has the potential of creating millions of jobs that India needs. Many of you who are perhaps not fully familiar with the needs of Indian employment uh, uh, generation, over a million people come into the Indian mainstream of employment every month. And there's 12 million jobs to be created every year. And that's no small task for anyone. The government is very clear that on one hand, we will make this country a clearly knowledge-based society, uh, therefore the digital India. We have to connect this country through a broadband uh, ne network that is required to go across the nation, not only just in the urban centers, but into the length and breadth of villages and rural area to connect all the people. On the other hand, we will fire up the manufacturing engine, the programs around skilling India, which are extremely important, and finally, building India's infrastructure, all put together, will, to my mind, generate the economic momentum that we need. 
So one part of the uh, equation that we need a clear policy making, we need a government which is uh, looking towards making business easy uh, uh, to be done in India. The other part of the equation is all of us assembled here today, the investors both global and Indian. We need to commit ourselves to make significant investments here. The good news is both the Indian and uh, the global investors are taking note of Indian opportunity. Last year, $44 billion came through FDI in India. First quarter of this year has already witnessed over $12 billion that has come into the country, which means on our exit basis, if you were to extrapolate, we could be hitting about $50 billion of money coming into India. Given that China and many other countries are slowing down, this amount could even be higher. Opportunity is big. Other places to invest are getting rather limited. And I would therefore encourage all our uh, visitors who are here from the globe, investors, business people, members of uh, the ICC, my colleagues on the executive board, all of them to concentrate and look at opportunities around these missions here in India. Let me uh, conclude by saying uh, uh, to the finance minister who is here today with us, we have the Minister of State of Finance, Mr. Jayan Sinha. We'll soon be joined by the finance minister, Mr. Jaitley that ICC is a body which is committed to growth of trade. When Mr. Jaitley was in uh, Turkey just last week, ICC was right there alongside through I IBAC and through the B20. ICC is giving leadership in that particular area to ensure that the final draft that comes through in November in Turkey for the G20, B20 meet finds the voice of the business and industry into the final statement that comes out of that particular uh, G20 mission. ICC is a nearly 100-year-old organization. 1919 was the time when it was founded. It has over 130 countries as its members and millions of uh, uh, members within those 130 countries. It therefore truly is the uh, world business organization. And many of you are already aware of its code of arbitration, which still remains as a most premium and sought after arbitration body in the world. Along with India Foundation, which is focused on development of India, which is focused on showcasing India's economic opportunities, I'm delighted that we could put this convention together. And during the day and the course of the day, we will have many panels where a number of senior ministers will come and talk to you. Talk to you. There will be opportunities to ask them various questions, and I want you to make the most of it. So with these words, let me Congratulate both the India Foundation and ICC organizers of having put this together, in particular Sandeep Somani and his team, which is ICC India, for having really contributed uh, towards this uh, event. Ladies and gentlemen, make the most of this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Bhargav uh, is an iconic leader of the manufacturing industry, so I'll request him to speak first. Uh, for Mr. Bhargav, the question is, uh, how do we deliver excellence at scale? Because we have to deliver quality and we have to deliver scale. And you've done it in Maruti. And uh, of course, please add other thoughts that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Dani, honorable minister, distinguished audience, and the distinguished panelists here. Uh, in Maruti, we have evolved over time because uh, when we started, it was a very different world from what it is today. But uh, the automobile industry is one industry today which can say that uh, it is actually making in India. It is making in India for the world and that most of the global players are in India. It, this has been done despite all the difficulties about ease of doing business, labor laws, and all the problems which have existed for these last 30 years. It has still been done. But the fact is that if the things which the present government is trying to do, if they actually get done on the ground, we will become by far, far the most competitive car manufacturer, and we would be able to increase volumes, employment substantially. So let me say that uh, skill development is one of the 
very important ingredients for making any manufacturing activity globally competitive. Without skill development, without having the right skills, it's not possible to produce quality, improve productivity, ensure competitiveness. But of course, other things are required. So skill development and the policy which government has announced re relating to skill development establishes not only that government recognizes the importance of skill development, the need for improving the skill development environment in this country. And uh, I think this policy is very welcome from, by all of us in industry because uh, it uh, really highlights something which needs to be done very badly. Having said that, let me say what we have learned in Maruti about how to implement things. Our first lesson is that before you start implementing, it is useful to analyze the root causes of why in the past you have not succeeded in implementing to the extent or in the manner in which you wanted to implement. After all, we have looked at skill development for the last 50 years or so. We have started setting up ITIs at that time. So that was also an admission that we wanted skill development in India. But the fact is we have not succeeded. And we have not succeeded for reasons which we need to identify. Broadly speaking, the supply and demand for skilled people has to match. In India, most of industry, for most of the time, did not find any particular reason to employ skilled people because in the license large, without competition, without export possibilities, there was no benefit to industry in terms of trying to improve productivity or quality or any such thing because you couldn't grow. And as competition comes along, the requirement for skills grows. And I think that's one of the reasons why we are today talking so much more about skill development than ever before. So the first requirement for skill development is that there must be a demand for skills, which means the user of the skills must find it's beneficial to use skilled people in terms of improving his competitiveness and that along with the other factors which improve competitiveness, he will be able to grow his business, become bigger and uh, profit in terms of uh, higher volumes and uh, higher sales. So that's one condition which needs to be created. Uh, skills is one part of it, but the other parts of it have also to be done so that costs and the, the ease of doing business, sir, which you've been, government's program, that and other factors which uh, come in the way of competitiveness need to be removed. The second is that the person who goes for skill development, and as Mr. Thidani said, if he is to pay for what he is doing, then he has to get a return on what he spends in getting that training, which means he must get employment after skills, which means there must actually be a demand for people to employ skilled people. And the person who gets skilled must see that because he's got skilled, he is actually going to benefit in terms of getting jobs, in terms of his career prospects, in terms of his remuneration. All of that must happen to him. Otherwise, he will say that, why do I spend money if I'm not going to get a benefit from the skills? The second aspect of skill development is the quality of the skills which are imparted to people when they apply for a job. I think over the years we have seen, and Maruti is today running something close to 30 ITIs. We have seen what's happened in these ITIs. There is an enormous gap from uh, the requirements of what is re uh, needed by industry for skills and what these ITIs teach because they have been run almost like a government department by different state governments. There has been no upgradation of the syllabus and the training courses in line with what industry has changed over the years and what today's industry requires. The infrastructure, the equipment, the machines which are used for training are still as old as uh, the time when the ITI was set up I doubt if any ITI has ever upgraded the equipment which they use. The teachers who 
teach in these ITIs are totally out of date in their knowledge. And the result of all this is the quality of the product which comes out is very, very uh, poor in terms of the employability. The only reason we employ the ITI people is that it helps in the selection process that you know a certain kind of uh, cutoff is done. But we have to train these people after training, and that is why we decided some time back to start adopting ITIs and then modernize their entire training infrastructure, teachers training and all of that and improve the quality of output so that what is done in the ITIs does not have to be replicated when they join the company and we can start using these people straight away. So I think that's the second part and I think, sir, you have to consider that in the skill development program and implementing this policy, what should be the arrangement for the management and operation of ITIs? How does industry and users get into it? How do these ITIs keep up to date in terms of what the technology requirements of industry today dictate should be the quality and method of teaching? I think those things have to be built into the system if they are left to the normal decision on files, it will never happen. The third thing which I think is required is that uh, while skills at the point of entry are important, much more skills are acquired by people during the course of their working. And that's something, sir, which I can say from experience, that workers who have been with us and who have identified with the company for their future have developed a lot of skills over the years they've been with Maruti. And it's these workers who, with their suggestions, with the quality circle activities which they take part in, are each year save us more than 350 crores just by the workers' suggestions. And that cannot happen if these workers did not have the skills to understand what they're doing, how they're doing, and how it can be improved. So the identification of workers with the company, the, the belief in them that the company and they are going to grow together in terms of careers, in terms of prosperity, is something is important. And I think for that, the labor laws have to be suitably amended. We have done it without amending the labor laws, but it's much easier if it is uh, done through a legal process which ensures this happens. And one of the difficulties which I think all industry faces, which I think is quite uh, contrary to the object of skill development, is the system of contract workers, where the worker has no identification with the company in which he works, and his skill development is virtually negligible. I think we need to look at how to provide both flexibility to industry to deal with the changes in technology, changes in demand, but at the same time ensure that skill development does not suffer because of this aspect. The fourth part uh, is that uh, the users of the skills must also start to take, and that's industry fundamentally, that uh, the view of skill development cannot be short term, cannot be that for immediate benefits of cost, I will use unskilled, low-cost workers to get uh, cheaper products if uh, they don't look at a longer-term period that we will benefit much more over the longer term if we develop skills and if uh, people are actually, uh, over time, getting more and more skilled and help in improving productivity, quality, because the cost of quality is not taken into account. And we find this uh, most in our component industry where because of the lack of uh, skilled manpower, because of the non-use of proper equipment, the quality problems in the smaller industries is the biggest. And if quality production and if skill development is going to take place, I think uh, for modern industry, for the making in the industry, we have to look at uh, changes in this system. So these are the main points which I had to make in this one. Thank you very much.